As a child, one of my favourite books, which I read over and over, was The Story of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter. Many of you may know the story of the orphan girl who was sent to live with her maiden aunt and spreads her own brand of cheerfulness and optimism around the small town. Her inspiration to always look on the positive side of life came from her father, small town minister, living life on the harsh American frontier. He took time to sit and count every occasion in the Bible where we are told to rejoice. In Pollyanna's words, he said that if God took the trouble to tell us 800 times to be glad and rejoice, he must want us to do it. From this role model grew Pollyanna's glad game, where she tried to find the positive in every situation. Now, this is a slightly sickly sweet story, and the characters are a bit twee, and the storyline predictable, with a sugar-coated ending, where everyone lives happily ever after. But at the nub and the heart of the story is this desire to see the good in every person and in every situation. Last week, Neil was speaking about the practice of lament within the church and about acknowledging in a very real way the necessity of saying, I am having a difficult time right now. This hurts. This is difficult and not rushing past it to find the quick fix. And that is a very important practice to undertake. However, this week, I'm going to look at the other side of the coin, finding God's blessings and giving them thanks for them in the place in which we are standing right now. It's very tempting to fall into the trap of looking for something else which will make us happy. A new job, a new house, a bigger car, more money in the bank. Let's face it, the end of this pandemic and a return to normality, whatever normality is. Contentment becomes a future ideal rather than a current reality. This morning's scripture readings may feel like a strange place to start when we're talking about blessings and thankfulness. One of the 800 verses which instruct us to be glad and rejoice may have seemed more obvious. But I want to look beneath the veneer of being joyful and into the practices which we use to become joyful at all times and in all situations, even when the circumstances are making us sad. The reading from Genesis, we have Joseph confronting his brothers for the first time since he'd been sold into slavery decades earlier. The last time he'd seen them had been from the bottom of a well where they were bargaining with slave traders. But now he was the one with all the power. He was the one in control. At that moment, Joseph could have made them pay for what they had done to him. He could have been angry and resentful, but he chose not to. He chose to take what had been meant for harm and focus on the positives instead. If he had not gone into Egypt, if he had not been elevated to such an exalted position, then his family and many others would probably not have survived this famine. This can be read in two ways. One is that God controlled the situation like a puppeteer and made sure that all the players were in the right place at the right time. However, I prefer the second interpretation. Joseph's brothers were exercising their free will when they chose to attack their younger brother and send him away. But that although they had intended harm, God worked in Joseph's heart, humbling the arrogant young man into a wise and prophetic leader. The tribes of Israel would have been saved anyway had that been God's will. But God used a bad situation and turned things around because Joseph was willing to be led by him. Right now, the world is in a bad situation. Our freedoms have been curtailed and our health is threatened. The impact of COVID-19 is far reaching. Beyond the physical threat of contracting the disease ourselves, it is impacting our mental health, our economy and damaging relationships. But there are positives. 
there are good news stories. As Captain, now Colonel Tom Moore, who inspired others to walk so they could, raise, they could also raise money for the NHS charities. And we have our own places of growth. Some have learned a new skill. My daughter has learnt to crochet and I suspect that come winter the entire family will be clothed from head to toe in something made of crochet. Some have been gardening or decorating their homes and others have spent their time and energies helping those who are struggling with the impact of lockdown and have found themselves fulfilled in new ways through groups such as Lend a Hand Can Tour. It is very easy to complain about the struggles of lockdown managing homeschooling and working from home, or loneliness and isolation. And many of these are valid and legitimate concerns and worries. I do not, under any circumstances, intend to brush them under the carpet. There are situations which require us to lament and we need to be mindful of the need to grieve all that we have lost or all that has changed. But every day there are things to be thankful for. For example, Every morning when I wake up, I open two gifts, my eyes. If I'm busy with a, in a busy house with children, then I am grateful that I have children and can complain about them. If I'm on my own, then I'm grateful that I have time and space to talk to God and draw nearer to him. When we are standing in the midst of our own lives, it can be difficult to see the blessings and we may peek at our neighbour and wish that we had it easy like them. Everyone else's Facebook story always looks much slicker and more polished than mine. Their kids are happy and don't bicker. The beautiful homes which never seem to get untidy. We don't see the difficult bits of other people's lives most of the time. We only see the good bits. So of course their life experience can look so much more appealing than mine. Many busy parents are searching for the isolation we were promised during lockdown, whilst those living alone would give anything to be surrounded by noise and clamour. So how can we appreciate what we have? How do we learn to count off our blessings? How do we do what Joseph did and see the good in the midst of the bad situation? And instead of cursing those who have hurt us or put us in a bad place, see how God has worked it out for his glory. Well, this leads us to the second reading. And if we are constantly looking for bad and negative things, then we will find them. If our eyes are unhealthy, that is, if we're looking at the unpleasant things in life, then it will taint our entire outlook. Some people can look at a rose and see only the thorns, whilst another will look at the same rose and see the beautiful flower and smell the fragrant scent. Our outlook becomes what we practice. If we have a nature which constantly finds fault, even in the good times, then when things become hard, that is where our thoughts will turn. But if we look for the presence of God in our lives as a constant habit, then that is where our minds will continue to turn when we are struggling. Where our thoughts and hearts are is where our treasure is stored. And if our thoughts are centred on God, then our habit will continue to search for God in every situation. And when we search, we will find him. It sounds so easy, and yet it is so hard to practice. The habits which we build up when times are easy are what carry us through when times are hard. So in a society where we're encouraged to count money, count the pounds, count steps, count calories. Let's be rebellious and let's think about counting some blessings instead.